So I recently got the itch to make another gameplay focused video akin to my 100 days on Don't Starve's Lunar Island one, but I wasn't really in the mood to play Don't Starve. I love that game, but I didn't have any really compelling ideas for what I would do to spice it up. Then I realized I have another game that I've been putting off playing more of that would be perfect for this, Mind Over Magic. For those who don't know, Mind Over Magic is a game by Sparky Pants and published by Clay that recently had a demo release on Steam. Back in May they sent playtest codes to the Clay Ambassador group, so I've had a little experience with this game but not nearly to the extent that I usually know like Pokemon or Don't Starve. And since this game is still in development, keep in mind that mechanics could change between now and release. To summarize this game, the world is… not in a good spot when you start it up. There's an eldritch force known as the Fog that seems to have consumed the entire world around you, and it's our job to push back the Fog by summoning kids with any modicum of magic talent to teach in our academy. Once they're fully trained, you can send your prodigies into the very normal dungeon sprawled beneath the foundations known as the Underschool, where they'll use their magic abilities to defeat bosses and buy your school a little more time. Time for what, you might ask? Time to study the other super normal thing below the school, the Book of Dread. Researching this book both pushes back the fog as well as unlocks more powerful wands for us to wield and unveils new paths through the underschool where we can face greater foes. So now that we have the basics of what we should be doing out of the way, let's see if we can steer our school to success and survive a hundred days in mind over magic. Also, if you like what I do here, you might want to subscribe to this channel and maybe follow me over on Twitch where I often stream the games that I turn into videos. We start off with a little preamble from Clementine, our school's founder, entrusting us with the Book of Dread before starting off in the underschool with three fully trained students who are about to start their trial to graduate. Aldair the Wolfkin, Birdie the Human, and Cordelia the Vivified. There are a few species in this game which mainly affect a character by setting their lifespan as well as their diet, and I'll introduce the others as we meet them. Wolfkin have the ability to eat raw meat and even live creatures, but they have slightly shorter lives than humans. Vivified will eat almost anything, with no bonuses or drawbacks, but given that they're basically what happens when Tim Burton gets into knitting, they don't last very long. Finally, humans can live the longest time, but as you likely know, we have very little in the way of special magical properties. Down in the underschool is this fortune teller looking device called the Oraculum, which we can interact with to plan a field trip down into the underschool. With nothing else to do, we send our three students out to kill the first boss, the Burrower Larva. While they do combat, we can't directly order our students, so we just sit back and watch the turn-based combat until our first graduating class triumphs over this overgrown caterpillar. I'm not actually sure it's possible to lose this fight, but with the prologue complete we get to select a perk from the Book of Dread, between unlocking the Gruel Pot and doubling its output, or starting with the mana refilling mana lantern already unlocked. I choose the doubling effect as we can research mana lanterns later, and with the Book of Dread open to its first page we head topside to see where we'll be spending our next hundred days. The surface is in a bit of a rough spot with fog only a few days from our doorstep. We meet the founder ghost formerly known as Clementine who is essentially a faculty member who never needs to eat or sleep. In order to beat back the fog we immediately need to gather resources and start building. By designating jobs for our faculty we can have them use their magic to gather the wood and stone we need. How fast a job gets done is tied to the relevant school of magic. For example a teacher with a high level of earth magic will mine rocks much faster whereas a teacher with a high level of fire will be very good at cooking. With two small rooms on the ground floor done, we build an arcane secretary, which acts as our research station for moving along the tech tree. With a few staff members getting low on hunger, we resort to scavenging the nearby vines for gut berries. They're not the most appealing food, but Cordelia's stitched stomach perk negates it, and Aldair is fine to subsist on the occasional dire rat, so they'll do for now. Planning our second floor, I make a small side room to serve as a sort of dorm room for the night. As night begins we see the fog turn red and advance, which it'll do every single night from here on. I mark some dire rats to be hunted as we need sinew in order to make a wand shaper. No points for guessing what that does. Unfortunately, night comes a bit earlier than I expected, and all of our faculty save Clementine just pass out wherever they feel like it in the school. Having beds will be very important as sleeping on the floor lowers our characters' conviction, and if students go to sleep with low conviction they have a chance to have nightmares and gain trauma. Staff with low conviction can have breaks which cause them to lash out before quitting the school entirely. The cots are done in the middle of the night, so I rouse our professors from their slumps and have them move into the bedroom as we begin day two. With the wand shaper taking shape and a few more dire rats hunted for viscera, we're able to place down a teaching stone that will allow us to train our students. The teaching stone is a bit basic, but it teaches in a well-rounded curriculum with no particular focus on any school of magic. I place a few wall torches around using the remaining viscera, as keeping our school well lit will help stave off some annoyances later down the line. 
Getting down to the business of shaping the wands our students will use, let's go over the wand designer. Each wand has a tier and two specialties of magic, going up in tier making the wand's magic cap out at a higher level, but also meaning that a student will need more time to be fully trained. The two specialties of wand will inform what the wielder is particularly good at. For example, a professor using an earth lightning wand will have higher levels for mining and researching. Before they get to our employee, however, a student will first need to pass their trial, which is where these combat specialties come in. Each wand gets to pick an offensive specialty and a defensive specialty, informing how much attack power and HP the student will have in the underschool, as well as granting that character a distinct ability for each element. Going down the list, Fire will start with a high attack power but has the Diminish keyword, which lowers their strength over the course of each combat. Chosen defensively, Fire will give Retaliate, a keyword that damages attackers when struck. Offensive Water gives Restorative, which heals the caster and their allies for the amount of damage dealt when attacking. Defensively, Water gives Fortify HP, increasing the HP of surrounding characters at the start of combat. Dark Magic applies wide, having a slightly lower attack power but damaging all opponents at once. Defensive Dark gives Dodge, which as you'd expect gives a chance to dodge incoming attacks. Nature gives Amplify, which is the inverse of Fire's Diminish, starting weak and growing stronger with each cast. On defense, Nature has Regenerate, healing the caster by a set amount with each attack they cast. Offensive Earth has Slow, which makes the character move after any characters that don't have Slow, but Earth also has the highest overall damage that doesn't shrink over time. Defensively, Earth gives Armor, which is a bit of extra HP from the beginning of each combat that depletes before actually taking damage. Offensive Lightning gives Chain, which not only can't be dodged but will do an extra attack on another enemy if their target is killed. Defensively, Lightning gives Intensify Attack, buffing the damage of surrounding allies. Last but not least is Air, which gives Fast on offense, casting once at the beginning of the round and again on their normal turn, allowing the wielder to cast two times per round. Finally, Defensive Air gives Shield, applying a number of shields at the beginning of each combat that can take a hit before actually taking damage. With all the magical keywords out of the way, we put in a job to make three attackers wands, which is one of the defaults provided and has fire offense and air defense. The combination of fire and air combined with the low HP of the first dungeon monsters means that a team of two students using attackers wands can clear the burrow or larva with no issue. This is what we'll be using to push the fog back most of the time, as each burrow or larva kill will buy about half a day's worth of fog pushback using only two low-level easy-to-train students. Once we have our wands built, the staff will take them down to the student summoner under the school to magically teleport in their chosen wielders. With our first class on its way, we set up another dorm above the classroom in preparation. While summoning students, we have a little void shroom crop up in our main hall. These fungal annoyances pop up in any room that isn't fully lit, and when fully grown, start sapping mana from anyone who walks by. Being mana drained is evidently unpleasant, as it'll cause a move penalty for a few hours. So while they're useful in a few crafting recipes, I try to remove these as they spawn and keep the rooms lit up enough to prevent them from showing up frequently. With the wands shaped, we get our first class of new students, Drya, Emery, and Finn. Training up students will happen so long as they and professors have class time scheduled and a proper spot to do so. During the night, a rain begins, which will quickly damage anything not under a roof, including delicate items like the bodies of all the dire rats we needed to slay for their various parts. Day 3 dawns and we finish up our research on chests, which require smoke sticks harvested from the local smoke reek plants. Chests can be packed quite tightly in the space available, so I designate the center room as a storage room and start piling in chests whenever we get more smoke sticks. We watch our new students take turns casting various spells in class before making a plot of bitter rice. Every species will eat bitter rice-based recipes, though it needs to be improved upon before it stops tasting terrible. With the orders in the gruel pot, I place a couple of dining tables to allow our mages to have a place to eat. Having completed most of the immediately relevant research available to us, we'll have to research the Book of Dread more to get more productive research done. By the end of the day, Drya has already managed to learn all that they can and become fully trained, which is especially useful because the fog is only four days from swallowing our school whole. With all the dire rat bodies stinking up the outside, I decide to place a few midden heaps, which will allow us to compost them down into more useful parts. The lack of particularly palatable food is starting to weigh on Drya and Finn, indicating that they're at a slight nightmare risk, likely not helped by the void shrooms growing directly at the foot of some of the beds. Early into day four, Emery and Finn finish their studies and we head to the Oraculum to send them against the burrow or larva once more. Because of their shields, they take no damage at all, and their literal high firepower takes the monsters out in one round, including the boss itself. When your students graduate, you have two options on where to send them, 
either incorporating them into your staff or sending them off to help nearby villages and earn pages to do research. I decide to only keep Drya as they're the only wolfkin, and with the precarious food situation I worry about feeding the other two who can't just nibble on the odd dire rat. Pushing the fog back a little has also spawned one of these misty crystals, which are essentially magical loot boxes containing all sorts of potions and meals. In order to get the pages for research, we need to send some number of graduates off into the world depending on which dungeon they graduated from, and in order to get the vivified pages we need to complete the Book of Dread, we need to send out at least three. Given this, I immediately summon another group of students with Gisela, Hiroki, and Irvin. We're going to be bringing in a lot of these small attackers wand classes over the course of our school because their cheap cost to produce the wands and quick turnaround time to train the students make them ideal for pushing back the fog while we train up higher level students. Because they'll only be in the school for a few days, if you see a student from here that I don't mention by name, they're probably just here to intern in fog pushing. As one of our professors trains our classes, I spend day 5 building another floor in the middle of the school. My plan is to make a sort of central column that I can build off of access by the spiral staircase. Our students finish their trial and we receive some vivified pages by completing the chapter 1 quest. Feeding these to the Book of Dread to research chapter 2, we get the choice between an extra powerful Verdant Wand or the Iron Will perk, which will reduce how much traumas affect our characters' conviction. Choosing the Iron Will perk, we now have access to tier 2 wands, as well as open the path to the Burrow or Moth Slayer. But most importantly, the fog has retreated massively, exposing more resources and space to build. As soon as the fog abates, I scout the area for these crow nests. Crow aren't hostile to our characters, but they will seek out and destroy any crops they can get their beaks on so destroying their spawners will prevent them from starving us out. At the beginning of day 6, we get our first instance of an event, which will have a temporary effect on the world. In this case, a horror culture has taken root in our crops, causing them to sometimes yield random body parts instead of their usual items. With the extra vivified pages that we obtained, we now have many options for new research. I start by researching pantries, plain beds, spice racks, and honeyed gruel, all of which will hopefully improve the quality of life around the school and make it more bearable. Our third floor has finally taken shape, so I convert one of the rooms into another dorm so we can accommodate more students. I deconstruct the cots and begin building plain beds to hopefully give them more restful sleep. Having gathered a lot of smoke sticks, I spend day 7 placing as many chests will fit in our storage room. Since a character can reach a chest as long as one side is accessible, you can wedge quite a lot of storage into one space, which will hopefully keep all of the valuables we accrue safe inside and free from the rain. On day 8, with all four of our students trained up, I send them off into the new boss's lair. I was fairly confident in their skills, but just in case, I sent them off with two health potions that we'd mined out of the misty crystals left by the fog. If a student takes lethal damage, they can save themselves with a health potion, but once those run out, they're gonna be in trouble. The enemies in this area have a few new abilities, like the Batkin here having fast, and the Lantern Keepers having intensify attack for their allies. But our shields were holding strong for the most part. The Burrower Moth has both Fast and Shield 3, but their allies only having 10 HP meant that we could easily take them out before focusing down the Moth. The long fight did make Diminish a lot more of a burden, and soon we found ourselves with only one attack power per cast, with the Moth's two attacks per turn whittling down our shields quickly. Tragically, just before the final blow was struck, the Burrower Moth used the last of its strength to kill Jess, cruelly flapped to death mere moments before graduation. Because we haven't researched the morgue table, any students who die in the underschool are just strewn randomly throughout our school once the trial concludes. After graduating the other three students, we bury Jess and hold a funeral. But hey, at least we can harvest hallow lilies from graves, so it's not a total loss. Learning from Jess's example, I decided to add a healer's wand to our next group of students to hopefully keep the whole group alive this time. Healer's wands have water's restorative attack as well as lightning's attack buff to allies, so my hope is that we'll make it out unscathed. We've also gathered some honey drop crystals from the wild honey drop plants that have spawned, allowing us to make the slightly more palatable honey gruel. Day 11 I begin assembling a mess hall so we can stop having meals in the same place we do all of our research. I move our two dining tables into the room above a classroom, and I figure this is a pretty good time to explain how rooms work in this game. Rooms have a lot of specific use cases that you can specialize them for. For example, if you wanted to make a dedicated bedroom, you'd need to have at least one bed, no crafting stations or teaching equipment, and the private keyword. Rooms gain keywords depending on how they're structured, and the private keyword means there's only one way in or out. Bit of a fire hazard if you ask me. These rooms can also be upgraded. For example, if you take a bedroom, add some recreational furniture, some windows and dining tables, you can create a common room, which boosts sleepers' conviction even more. So by moving the dining tables into a new room with no workstations, we can make it into a mess hall. 
We also encounter a new mob while moving a pantry and dumping its contents onto the floor, a gremlin. Gremlins show up if there are too many items strewn about indoors, and quickly ransack any items they can find. After quickly dispatching the menace, we can section off the scullery to get a small bonus to cooking speed. After our remodeling, our students are ready for round 2 versus the Burrower mob, so we put our healer plan into action. Surprisingly, the small bit of healing per round makes a huge difference, allowing our class to make it all the way through with no casualties and snag 12 wolfkin pages for our research. Researching Chapter 3 unlocks the first boss that can't be defeated with just basic wands, the Burrower Spitter, as well as gives us the choice between the Power Through Preparedness perk, which increases our max inventory for potions and trials, or the Path of Least Resistance perk, which will heal our students before the boss room. Choosing the Path of Least Resistance, we're able to push the fog back to 15 days away and uncover an area teeming with exotic materials. Runewood trees, sculptstone veins, and some exotic new creatures like chapdoor vines and unstable anemones. Runewood and sculptstone require level 4 in nature and earth respectively to harvest, so we'll have to train someone up with the proper skills before we can make tier 4 wands. Day 12 dawns and I marvel at all the potential researches we can learn. Wolfkin pages allow us to research specialized teaching stations which will allow us to make classrooms dedicated to one specific school of magic but I decide to begin with researching chalkboards, which will be required to both upgrade our general classroom as well as make upgraded classrooms down the line. Having progressed to chapter 3, we summon our first student of the Raven Cultist species. These Plague Doctor lookalikes are actually a bit problematic. Raven Cultists have high magical potential, but they also suffer from, you know, being in a doomsday cult, and thus have permanently lowered conviction compared to others, making them extremely prone to nightmares as a result. On day 13, we get our first taste of A Wasting It Rises, which is an event that pauses all plant growth on the map. This will not be the last we see of this event, trust me. Having summoned 9 more students in an attempt to farm more vivified pages, on day 14 I decide to place a new teaching stone in the classroom, as each student currently has to wait for 8 others to take their turn before they can get another cast. This speeds their learning up enough that we fully trained all of them by the middle of day 15. Since the fog is a long ways away, instead of sending them in three at a time to push it back more, I send in all nine at once as the burrower larva succumbs to a swarm of teenage mages. With two in reserve to complete the quest, I decide to summon ten new students in order to get enough vivified pages to complete all of the chapter two researches. Since we'll need a student who can reach nature four to chop runewood, I design a tier three fire and nature wand for them to wield, which will also make them a sure hand at cooking with their high level fire magic. Day 16 opens up with us completing the bookshelf research, which is another thing that will allow us to create a better classroom. I also realize at this point that we need brains of all things to make chalkboards, which drop from putting crow bodies in the midden heap. Because I've destroyed every crow nest before any could spawn, we've ironically never seen a brain at all in this school. Resigning myself to needing to leave the crow alone for now, I begin researching the Scrivener's Desk, our first form of recreation. The more powerful our wands get, the more recreation we'll need to keep their wielders stable. After putting in a summoning order for our tier 3 fire nature wand, we summon our next future staff member, Lupita. On day 21, we finish researching the foundation, which allows us to finally extend the tiny bit of foundation we start the game with. I use this to build a dedicated room for the scullery, which also has the knock-on effect of spawning a gremlin that manages to chew up an entire brain and some vivified pages before our staff put a stop to it. I decide to research some other items like the spindle, a workstation that lets us craft the quilted. By sewing together some of the body parts we get from the midden heap, we can stitch up some Beetlejuice nightmares to do the more mundane jobs for us like chopping or mining. Day 22 we have our first run in with trapped ore vines. Because I made some quilted lumberjacks, I marked a few trees out towards the fog for chopping, which meant a few staff members also attempted to chop them down. Trapdoor vines are easy enough to defeat if you harvest them before they can cast their bind spell, but since they were busy chopping trees, three of my staff members managed to get themselves ensnared in vines. After sending Clementine to administer some untangling potions, Lupita finally finishes his training, allowing us to send him in with the other attacker's wand students for a risk-free graduation. With Lupita fully trained, I begin to wonder if we can get even more fog pushback with fewer students, so I put in an order on day 23 to summon 12 Fire Air Tier 2 wielders. With the increased firepower, we should be able to defeat the burrower larva with just two or even one student, and training up a huge class of students at once will give us more time from the fog than we spent training them. We also finally have five Croa brains to work with and make our first specialized classroom by building a spark orrery, which is when I realized the room I was planning to make into our lightning classroom is actually too short to contain the teaching station at all, 
Since one of our dorms is actually tall enough, I decided to do a quick swap and move the beds to the new room and build the spark orrery there. At the beginning of day 25, I get down to planning how we might take down the burrow or spitter. I know from experience that this dungeon has enemies with both regenerate and amplify, which will make them a hard counter to just storming through with fire and air wands, as they'll heal up and get stronger with each attack, potentially outhealing our diminished attack power. I decide to summon four earth air students who will have consistently high attack and bolster them with two water lightning students who will heal them and buff their attack power. With the spark orrery up and running, we'll finally have a dedicated lightning classroom which should help our students learn that skill much faster. On day 26, we finally have another set of crow brains to use in making a chalkboard, which upgrades our lightning classroom into an advanced classroom for having two bookshelves and a chalkboard. We pass another trial and I decide to bring on Presley as one of our staff, as we have a lot of tasks around the school to get done. I'm a little worried considering he's a raven cultist, which means his mental is lower than most, but hopefully he just doesn't have his one bad day away from quitting. I also send in a group of mages armed with fire air tier 2 ones to see if they can handle our burrow or moth without a healer, which they manage only needing a little healing from potions. With the crow parts coming in at a steady pace now, I'm able to upgrade our basic classroom into an intermediate classroom, which will give a boost to the rate students learn from the teaching stones. We also have our first run-in with what I thought was a bug at the time, where one of these random beds has flagged itself as unreachable. This is actually because Birdie, the bed's owner, managed to seal themselves into a corner while building a bookshelf. On day 28, Birdie's near starving alerts me to the fact that they've been amontillado'd into a corner, so I shift the bookshelf over to free them. Speaking of being trapped, during the night of day 29, one of our raven cultists has our first nightmare. Basically, students who go to bed with low conviction can sometimes be grabbed by the underlords in their sleep, which wraps every other student sleeping in the same room in tentacles. The student that caused the nightmare will always gain a trauma when they wake up, and every other student who is still bound by morning will also gain a trauma. Inconvenient all around, to say the least. Trauma reduces the amount that you can raise a character's conviction, and enough trauma will eventually kill characters outright. Luckily for everyone involved, Blythe was in a relatively small bedroom, so no one but them suffered trauma from it. We've finally trained up our Tier 3 students, who are ready to take on the Burrow or Spitter. I equipped them with plenty of potions and shipped them off. And not to doubt their success, but I also immediately put in an order for 15 attackers once, just in case the burrow or spitter wipes them out and we need to push back the fog, which has gotten quite close. My fears prove unfounded, as our healer manages to slay the burrow or spitter and push the fog back a whole three days, buying us plenty of time. I bring on Ephra and Demetria, as their higher level lightning, water, earth, and air magic should make them a valuable addition to our staff. With Demetria's level 4 earth magic allowing us to finally mine sculpt stone deposits. Sculpt stone and large stone outcrops pop up a lot in the outer extremities of the map, which can often seal off other useful items behind them as they block the entire path. Sending out five of our students, we also managed to complete the Chapter 3 quest, allowing us to get our first Raven Cult pages and delve into Chapter 4. Chapter 4 only has one perk currently, Sanctuary in the Sky, which instantly researches magical supports and provides us with 200 sculpt stone, enough to build four of them. Magical supports are essentially foundations you can place in the sky, allowing you to support structures that otherwise would need to be connected to the ground. On day 31, I get a notification that we're apparently out of food. Not that we don't have ingredients, it's just that the teachers have had so many other higher priority jobs scheduled that they've ignored cooking any meals. I end up making cooking a higher priority and the situation is quickly resolved. With an unprecedented 15 students at once, I decide to convert the leftmost ground floor room into another intermediate classroom, to hopefully keep them all learning at a decent rate. We finish researching the Dragon Walk, which is used to make more advanced meals, some of which boost conviction by quite a bit but can only be eaten by one or two species, usually one specific species in Vivify. I also realize that we need a reagent known as Smoke Pearl to make chimneys, which are required to upgrade our scullery into a proper kitchen. Smoke pearls are retrieved automatically from the fog by ghosts who spawn from upgraded graves, so I set my sights on researching the wandering mage's grave next. The dragon walk also doesn't benefit from our dream of plenty perk, so it'll only make one meal at a time unlike the gruel pot. On day 32 we begin to run low on meals again with so many characters around our school, but the students also begin to finish their training, so we can easily reduce the amount of food we need each day by sending them off into the world. That night, Ephra manages to get themselves bound by a trapdoor vine, so I use the excuse to send out the rest of the faculty to mine misty crystals, as well as have Lupita use their high nature magic to finally get our first bits of runewood. 
We also get our first sample of anemone cells, which are particularly tricky to obtain as unstable anemones will destroy themselves when exposed to sunlight and fully grown. And anemone cells are used in high-level wands and a lot of other crafts like teaching stations and potions. On day 33, I decide having the spindle and scrivener's desks in such a large room isn't a great use of space, so I make a small art room for them to go in off the side of the lightning classroom. I begin extending the central staircase upwards in preparation for us unlocking new specialized teaching stations. While I'm distracted, a flock of spectral croa descends on the school, smacking up whatever they can get their ghostly beaks on. We also meet a new kind of annoyance, the ooze, which apparently spawns when our staff don't clean up after themselves in the kitchen. After being beset again by another horde of ghost crow on day 35, I decide to place down some spectral snares which will banish any hostile ghost that steps on them. They do reduce the luxury of a room when placed inside, but we were clearly killing more crow than we could bury in the midden heaps, which was causing their ghostly rampages every night. After a bit of restructuring, we were also finally able to get our second specialized classroom with the Zephyr mechanism, which will allow us to train air much faster. At the beginning of day 36, having finished researching chapter 4, we summon our first student of the last species of character, Wolf the Shattered. Shattered are these glassy humanoids that are immune to a bunch of negative effects, including being entangled by trapdoor vines, but they're also the shortest lived species in the whole game, living only about 30 in-game days. Speaking of which, Cordelia has reached 65 days old, which is over the Vivified's normal lifespan of 60 days. Teachers who have reached old age will work slower and eventually die unless they drink Elixir of Youth, which we haven't unlocked. But on the upside, the students they teach learn slightly faster. Day 38 and we're really starting to get strapped for food. The Wasting Arises event has been popping up a lot more, possibly because we've researched up to the final chapter of the Book of Dread, and it's really starting to affect our food supply. Since bitter rice is the only food that everyone will eat, it's hard to effectively use any other species-specific crops as you can't control which species of student will be chosen for any given want. As if the slight famine wasn't enough, Cordelia's stitched heart finally gave in, meaning everyone is also annoyed that they had to see their teacher's body on the way out of the main dorms. We bury her in a wandering mage's grave so that even in death she can supply us with some smoke pearls as a ghost. Luckily for us, the wasting event ends at the end of this day, and we can harvest all of our bitter rice plots to alleviate the food supply issue for now. I decide to place the gruel pot down again so that even with a small amount of bitter rice we can still produce enough meals that, while not tasty, will tide us over in a pinch. Aldair and Drya have reached old age, and Aldair dies just before we research how to make elixir of youth. Drya is at least taking the opportunity to start training students at a rapid pace. A class of seven Earth Air Tier 3 wielders have just wrapped up their training, so I send them into the fourth boss lair with an assortment of potions to see how they fare. Their wands seem very effective against this dungeon, as most of the rooms are against two of these Hell Maws, which, while powerful, dealing a staggering 35 damage with each hit, they can't break our shields before falling to our powerful Earth magic. Our students seem unstoppable until we reach the boss of the dungeon, the Thrall Mage. Turns out, this boss has Wide, which absolutely shreds our shields and rapidly runs through our health potions, causing Mike, Yvonne, and Indra to meet their end before the boss is defeated. I decide to send off three of the four remaining students and bring Wolf on, mostly because I want to see how an adult Shattered looks. Day 41, I begin bullying the Burrower Moth larvae even harder by sending only two students at a time to defeat them. This is mostly so I can push back the fog even more, as I'm no longer concerned about farming vivified pages from the first quest. We also have too few beds, as some of the students are getting the slept on floor debuff, and the raven cultists in particular are really starting to feel the mood drop. As a test, I decide to send Octavio here into the first dungeon with three health potions just to see how he does, and he managed to completely solo the larva needing only a single heal. After playing around with the wand designer, I realized we need a mage capable of level 5 nature magic in order to make tier 6 wands, so I make a tier 5 earth nature wand to hopefully unlock that ability. We begin to run out of wolfkin pages as we haven't done the second dungeon for a long while, but we finally have enough unstable anemone cells to make an elixir of youth, which will temporarily stave off the negatives of old age. Anemone cells are going to be in short supply, so without more we won't be able to delay the inevitable for long. Another class of 5 Earth Air Tier 3 students are ready to take on the Thrall Mage, so learning from last time, I send them down with the maximum number of healing potions in the hope they all make it back and we can obtain some shattered pages. But at the last chamber, they didn't prioritize the boss who, with the extra last few attacks, managed to pick off three of them before being defeated. Whoops. On day 46, I can finally make use of the magical supports we unlocked, 
building out another advanced classroom off the side of the air classes. Knowing that we need to train Victor, our Earth Nature Mage, I decided to turn this into the Earth Classroom with the sculpting slabs. A group of students with Lightning Air Tier 3 wands are ready to graduate, so I send them down into the second dungeon to try them against the Burrower Moth, which actually goes surprisingly well and nets us some more Wolfkin pages. By day 48, our crops have really taken a beating. Not only are Croas pecking away at them, but the combination of a wasting arises and a horror culture infects the soil have made it basically impossible to grow any food. Out of a bit of desperation, I decide to send some of our faculty out on a treasure hunt. Basically, once you've beaten a chapter, you can send teachers into that chapter's dungeon in search of materials and food instead of killing the Underlord, at the cost of a few pages from that chapter. Ephra, Wolf, and Demetria absolutely demolish the Chapter 1 dungeon, and we find 25 honeyed gruel alongside a bunch of other annoying to obtain items. With all this going on, Drya also died of old age out in the field. Victor finishes their training, so I send them in to solo the burrower larva for an easy graduation. Having such a high tier regenerate spell, Victor could completely outheal the boss and both of the monsters in the front room. Halfway through our challenge on day 50, we finally finish up researching support columns. Because the private keyword requires we only have one entrance to a room, we can finally knock down these hallways and replace them with support columns, which will finally unify all of these bedrooms into a single one with only one entrance. This will hopefully stop everyone from having the slept in a non-bedroom mood debuff, which, while minor, was still annoying them. We also shortened the dorm ceiling slightly to make room for another advanced classroom on the fourth floor, adding the infernal pyre to make a fire classroom. The amount of crow on the left side of our school is starting to become a nuisance, so I decided to build a small side building to both have a place to put our morgue as well as build a physical wall to keep the crow out. This way, instead of having any underschool casualties randomly teleport into our school, we can have them teleported to the morgue tables instead. On day 54, we finally have our final three advanced classrooms laid out. I decide to stack them up here into sort of an advanced tower where we can have a Tree of Life, Fountain of Knowledge, and Eldritch Portal teaching station for the Nature, Water, and Dark classes respectively. With very little to eat, however, I need to rely on treasure hunts due to how often the Wasting Arises event is active, making it difficult to keep our staff fed, let alone more students. Once the event clears up though, we're free to summon a few more classes, but it's definitely becoming a difficult balancing act to have meals for everyone. Having researched outdoor support columns, I attempt to extend the workshop a bit so that we can have more recreational furniture available for characters to use. I also decide to send down another group for a treasure hunt, which ends in the untimely death of Ephra, who, because they were wielding a wand made for healing, was focused down and killed right before they could make it out of the dungeon. On day 60, I decide to keep Dax from one of our Burrower Moth hit squads to make up for the lost manpower. By day 61, we finally made an advanced classroom for every school of magic, meaning we no longer need these boring old teaching stones. I also have a wall built on the other side of the school to keep the crow out on that side, meaning we can use that side to plant crops as well. I decide to plant our newly researched jumping nuts, which are used to make the preferred food of raven cultists, bouncing bread. With easels also researched, we now have a whole two types of recreational activities to enjoy. Easels are nice because as characters use them, they have a chance to create portraits that you can hang along the walls of your school. You get quite a lot of these, so there's little reason not to cover every wall in the finest art available. On day 64, we finally have our first staff break. Turns out when building those aforementioned easels, Victor here managed to seal themselves into a corner birdie style and nearly starved to death. That combined with the fact that he couldn't reach his bed and he was wielding a relatively high power wand was just too much on his mental state, so after a long bout of insulting anyone unfortunate to walk past him, he climbed down to the student summoner and left the school altogether. Unfortunately, he also took his wand with him, which means that we also just lost the one person who could cast high enough level nature magic to make tier 6 wands, so we'll have to start that whole process over again. On day 65, we had another staff leave our employee in a more conventional way as Presley died of old age. I'm honestly shocked that he managed to reach old age rather than quitting given all the times his raven cultist lineage almost caused it, but as a ghost hopefully he'll be able to find a little more peace. On the bright side, this is technically making our food supply go a bit further than it otherwise would. We may have been able to make him an elixir of youth, but the wasting event is having a negative effect on all of the crops, not just the ones that we want to eat. Because our anemone cell planter's supply has dried up and deprived us of one of the key ingredients of Elixir of Youth, Birdie finally succumbs to old age as well. Unfortunate, but there's little we can do in the face of this constant wasting. On day 68, I realize we only have five faculty members left, four if you don't count the ghost of Clementine. 
To remedy this, instead of sending them out for Wolfkin pages, I decided to bring on Alex and Wendy from another one of our Burr Moth expeditions. Wolf is already pushing old age, as the Shattered naturally don't live very long, so we may find ourselves with fewer and fewer teachers if we don't keep recruiting our students. To that end, I recruit Gavin on day 69, and Vada, who we've entrusted another tier 5 Earth nature wand, is almost fully trained. The deaths don't slow down from here, however, as Wolf dies later in the day, and with that, Demetria is the only faculty left who is still in old age, but Lupita is quickly catching up and also not far from retirement. Another ooze that my faculty blissfully ignored over the night broke our entire kitchen and really had me fed up with all of these fantasy annoyances, so I decided to make hunting a critical priority. As soon as another ooze or gremlin spawns, everyone's gonna drop what they're doing and mercilessly hunt it down, even forgoing food and sleep. Maybe a little drastic, but a single ooze did just trash the entire kitchen. With Vada fully trained, we can finally bring them onto the payroll, and hopefully have them grow this batch of tier 5 lightning air wands that I'm going to try and use to defeat the Thrall Mage. I'm hoping that just by having a higher tier of wand, we can do enough extra damage and have enough extra shields to get through the fight with no casualties. The only downside being that they'll take longer to train, and have a very unstable mental state due to the high wand level. Fingers crossed that none of them are raven cultists. With so many teachers dying of old age recently, I decided to place a few more unstable anemone planters, which will hopefully keep some of our more tenured staff from keeling over a little while longer. Since we're no longer using the first floor classroom space for anything, I decided to turn it into another dining room, hopefully giving everyone in the school a spot at the table during mealtime. Then, during day 72, the weirdest disaster strikes. Whenever you push back the fog, it spawns more resources for you to mine. However, while some of my students were doing their trial, Dimitri and Vada were out gathering resources when the fog receded, and blocked their path back to the school by dumping a bunch of rocks in their path. Because they had already spent most of their mana mining other rocks, the two were not happy to spend the night out in the forest, which quickly devolved into Vada having a break and quitting. These tier 5 mages really have a knack for getting stuck and then blaming me. So now we need another mage capable of level 5 nature before we can make tier 6 ones, so that's nice. On the night of day 76, we get one of the most damaging nightmares yet. Genevieve the Raven Cultist not only has her second nightmare in a row, but also manages to give a record 9 other students a trauma in a single night, as we ran out of untangling potions from her last nightmare. Maybe if I play this game again, I'll put the students in separate bedrooms to prevent things like this from happening. Let it never be said I don't learn from my mistakes though, as when Edward the Raven Cultist has a nightmare literally the next night, We've brewed plenty of untangling potions to resolve it as best we can. And yet, Lizette the Raven Cultist has another nightmare on day 78, and we've somehow run through some 20 untangling potions in 3 days. Luckily, these students are almost fully trained and manage to get into a trial before any further nightmares have a chance to add even more trauma. I'm not saying all my biases against Raven Cultists are fair, but their downsides make themselves very apparent when you get stronger wands. Speaking of stronger wands, these tier 5 wands absolutely wallop the Thrall Mage, and the entire class of 6 makes it out, only needing one health potion the entire trip. We manage to complete the quest after only 3 expeditions and some 5 dead students, and bring on Fanny, Chena, Lizette, and Jared as teachers. Speaking of dead students, I may have accidentally sent a group of students meant to kill the Burrower Moth into the Thrall Mage's dungeon. They actually managed to win every fight in the dungeon, but tragically and unsurprisingly were no match for the boss. So make that 8 students killed by the Thrall Mage actually. On day 79, Gavin finishes his research into the final chapter of the Book of Dread using the Shattered Pages we just obtained, which has a few weird side effects that make the end of this challenge quite a bit harder. I'm not entirely sure why, but once we research the final chapter, we lose the ability to send students out on quests when they graduate. This means that not only do we have to bring on any students we train just to push the fog back, but we also can't earn any more pages, meaning we're unable to do any more research or treasure hunts beyond what we already have the pages for. Speaking of which, our teachers are so strong that I'm comfortable sending Lizette, Fanny, and Edward down into the underschool on a level 2 treasure hunt, which yields plenty of annoying to obtain resources as well as 25 honeyed stir fry. I attempt to send the same squad down into the dungeon again a while later, which is when we learn that when teachers go on breaks, they abandon the treasure hunt if they're on one. Without the ability to send students away, we quickly find ourselves with a roster of over 20 staff and quickly rising. 
Since we can't just ask them to leave, I decide to send ten of our newest faculty down into a treasure hunt that they sadly won't come back from. Not that I don't believe in their abilities, but I did build ten new graves before they were even done with the expedition. One of these new graves was also immediately filled when Lupita finally succumbed to old age, and this is when I realized that we had run out of another important ingredient for Elixir of Youth, ectoplasm. It only has a few sources, but I had an idea for where we could get a lot more of the stuff. As we buried the last of our unfortunate expedition, I noticed that we had started an event that would have been perfect if we had not just gotten all of our expendable staff killed, cursed canvases. Basically, for the duration of the event, anyone using an easel will have a chance to put a little extra into their work, and create an extremely luxurious cursed painting at the cost of a little extra trauma or some of their lifespan. Luckily, we had two brave volunteers in the form of Byron and Devon here, who both managed to create one cursed painting each. Demetria, despite not even putting part of her soul into a painting, also died of old age soon after the event ended. Since we built those surrounding walls to keep the crow at bay, we had sort of just let their numbers skyrocket as we no longer needed to destroy their nests on site. Since the easiest way to farm the ectoplasm we needed is to get lots of spectral crow to spawn, I ordered everyone to hunt down every last crow on this side of the map, which ended up being over 20 of them. And knowing that we didn't have the midden heaps to store their bodies, this ended up spawning a huge wave of vengeful bird spirits that we could then hunt down a second time to give us plenty of ectoplasm. Since treasure hunts were such a vital part of our food supply, and research would consume some of the few pages we had to embark on them, I decided to halt all research, which meant we only had one piece of furniture needed to create a dedicated classroom research with the ion conduit. I decided to build a new room on top of the water room, and decided to convert the now empty room into a fine kitchen, which needs large spice racks and a few chimneys to upgrade from a scullery. By day 87, a class utilizing a new one combo I created are finally ready to take on the trial. Because the Burrow or Spitter does 20 damage per hit, for these wands I wanted to try a new combination of air and nature. Air's fast attack lets us attack twice in a round, and nature's regenerate heals us for every cast. This group also contains Ava, our replacement's replacement after Victor and Bada both got themselves stuck and quit. Even though I sent them down with 10 health potions, this class didn't even end up needing one of them, taking down the boss with minimal difficulty. Though they may have needed one of the health potions if the boss decided to focus one of them down. Day 89 and we have Edward go on a break. I can't say I'm entirely surprised that the two raven cultists that gained multiple traumas as students ended up quitting, but it is still annoying that this one species that we researched the specialty food for keeps leaving after single inconveniences. Speaking of low sanity, I finally decide to make our first tier 6 wands now that we have both the resources to make them and someone capable of casting level 5 nature magic. The downside of the high tier wands has become very apparent with how many wielders have quit or had nightmares, and as if to prove my point, Fanny then breaks mid-treasure hunt. At this point, because we can't say no to new staff, any that decide to quit of their own volition are actually doing me a service. We reach day 90 and we've got 11 days of fog left, so as far as I'm concerned, the challenge is complete. But we still have unfinished business down in the underschool. Our tier 6 students have been summoned and immediately are already in the danger zone when it comes to nightmares. Given how long their training is going to take, we're going to have to do something or their nightmares and resulting trauma will have them dead before they even hit fully trained. To this end, I decided to try and upgrade the bedroom a bit, as that seemed like the most readily available thing to fix. The best shared bedroom is the house commons, which requires at least three dining tables, five beds, five recreational furnishings, and three large windows, as well as the towered, elevated, and private keywords. This presents a bit of an architectural riddle as towered rooms require no rooms above or to the sides, and elevated requires no foundation and no rooms below. I puzzled this over with a few different designs before arriving at a simple conclusion that you can simply make the room supporting the whole thing not a room by knocking out one of its walls. Even with this structural puzzle solved, we still could only make the slightly less restful common room, because I didn't have enough ice petals for three large windows, and once again, the ever-present a wasting arises has to clear out before we could actually get any more. Unfortunately for some of my students, it was a bit too little too late, as some of them had already had so many nightmares by this point that they couldn't even get their conviction above a minor nightmare risk threshold anymore. Once the wasting arises event cleared out, I immediately grabbed as many ice petals as I could and made a house commons with the three large rectangular windows we could now build. Since they wouldn't really benefit from the newly furnished house commons, I decided to have the students who had already been too traumatized sleep in the common room, as their downward spiral would make them unable to enjoy the house commons' luxury. 
and unfortunately my fears were confirmed when Wilder died of trauma just before they became fully trained. With the dawn of day 99 and my strongest students fully trained, I was finally able to send them into the final dungeon. This dungeon is brutal, putting you up against two rooms that contain two burrower spitters each, followed by another with a burrower moth. This is also where I learned that if a student's conviction drops too far, they can just quit the trial altogether. And due to the lack of sleep and food available in the underschool, the strain of their high tier wands was becoming too much to bear. One by one, they abandoned the quest, leaving only Ernest the Vivified to die alone to the burrower moth that they might have defeated with their friends' support. But having survived a hundred days in this school, and as the fog finally rolls over the building and everyone in it, Perhaps some mysteries are best left in the underschool for you to uncover. Thanks to Sparky Pants and Clay for providing this first look at Mind Over Magic, and thanks for watching.